Hello and welcome to Banking and Capital Markets. My name is Dr. Ola Brown and in this module I'll be going through um, some of the more interesting parts of the Banking and Capital Markets module. Um, there's eight units in this module, um, starting with an introduction to banks and financial markets, um, financial intermediation, risk and uh, risk management, which is probably the most complex part, um, and then credit rationing, shadow banking, competition and efficiency, banking and financial crises, and banking and regulation. So first, starting with banks and financial markets. Um, in terms of financial um, intermediation, as most people know, um, there are two types of banks, wholesale and retail banks, and under wholesale, their investment and um, corporate banks. Um, financial markets and intermediaries provide alternatives for the flow of funds between households um, as savers and firms in need of finance as borrowers. And securitization is the process by which borrowers and savers are matched through financial markets. Um, I'd also like to talk about off-balance uh, off sheet activity, um, which accounts for nearly 50% of bank revenues. So apart from the business of taking deposits and giving loans, banks also um, make a, a, almost 50% of their revenues, as I said, from off-balance sheet activities like swaps, brokerage, import, export payments, trust and advising and hedging. Um, so just to know that there are off-balance sheet activities that do exist and they're quite prominent in terms of bank revenues. Now, the real meat of this um, unit is around bank orientated versus stock market orientated economies and how they function differently and what their origins are. So in terms of functionality, um, corporate governance, obviously the, the shareholder structures and reporting structures that you get in a stock market orientated economy or a stock, um, uh, a company listed on a stock exchange are quite different um, from those that banks um, have given loans to in terms of risk sharing, dissemination of information, debt restructuring. I mean, when companies list on stock exchange, one of the major things that they talk about is a, is a complete loss of privacy. Um, so, you know, in terms of dissemination of information as well, um, I think that um, stock market listed companies um, end up being a lot more open about their financials compared um, to companies that banks have invested in um, through loans. Um, in terms of debt restructuring procedures as well, um, how they um, raise money and how they restructure um, the financing that they have received um, is often different um, between um, bank orientated and market orientated um, economies. And this um, also, um, economists like to, you know, look into the reasons why some economies have developed as bank orientated and some have developed as um, stock market orientated. And one of the reasons put forward by um, economists is because of the difference between common law and civil law. So um, they look at the history and, um, you know, try and draw cons um, some correlation between countries that have had common law with that offers better investor protection and say that those countries are more likely to have developed stock market orientated economies compared to those that have had civil law um, and usually develop more uh, bank related economies. Um, later and more modern arguments um, also exist around vested interests um, and the arguments around vested interests are that, um, you know, it's not to do with common law or civil law. Um, and actually, the economists that came later picked a lot of holes in the arguments on common law and civil law. Um, and the more modern economists think it's more due to um, vested interests and countries that have, ha that have very big um, influential monopolies that control the flow of finance um, very rarely um, let stock market orientated um, economies develop and prefer bank orientated economies because they have more control over them. Unit two is one of my favorite units um, in the entire banking and capital markets module. 
financial intermediation. And in this unit, we'll be exploring the theories of financial intermediation, the types of transformation performed by banks, the role of signalling as a response to adverse selection, the benefits of forming coalitions for portfolio diversification, and moral hazard. The central question for this unit is, why do we need banks at all? Why can't we just transact with each other without going through an intermediary in the first place? And the Arrow debut model um, says that banks would make zero profit if firms and households had unrestricted access to financial markets. And financial autocracy describes a situation where there's no bank and therefore no financial intermediary. So individuals just maintain their own pools of funds. There are also big disadvantages of banks. Number one, they're expensive. And if you live in Nigeria you, and you're used to getting bank charges for every single transaction, um, you might honestly think, why do we need these intermediaries? Why can't we just give loans to our friends? Um, and the second is that the customers bear the cost of running the bank. So, um, you know, we continually have to shell out to, to, to run these institutions. They also pose a risk to the borrower. So if there's ever a bank run, for instance, and it places um, it, it places um, the borrowers at risk. And then number four, they're also a risk to the economy. I mean, I mean, banks failing can start contagion um, or start an episode of contagion that, you know, collapses multiple banks and collapses the economy. So they they are a massive risk. Um, so. Why do we need banks? What exactly do they do um, that is so essential that we feel like we can't do without them or we can't run our finances without them? Um, and those reasons are given in the diagram in the centre of this slide. And the first one that I'll be talking about is, is their transformation role. And there's lots of types of transformations that banks perform. Um, they perform size transformation, maturity transformation, and risk transformation. Size transformation is the amount of money that a bank takes in compared to what it gives out in loans. So according to the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, about 90% of deposits in Nigeria, the total money in people's bank accounts, is probably less than $1,000 per person. Yet, Big business people like the Dangotes, like the Sabads, need billions of dollars um, for their loans for the different business projects that they want to take on. So therefore, um, banks perform that size transformation, taking on lots of these tiny deposits and converting them and um, sort of co co uh, co um, combining them into a much bigger loans um, for industry. The second is maturity transformation. And maturity transformation is, or um, addresses the fact that most of these small retail um, loans are actually short-term, short-term deposits um, made by um, ordinary individuals, households. And what the banks do is, you know, Dangote, Samad's projects are gonna take years to pay back. So they do that trans um, maturity transformation, transforming you know, these tiny sort of short term deposits into much longer loans. And then the third is a risk transformation. And they're able to uh, transform the risk that you would face from sort of one industry um, by diversification um, across many industries. So, for example, during COVID, the airline industry didn't do well. So if you were one person who had lent all your money to an airline, um, you probably wouldn't be able to get it back. But because um, banks are so um, sort of diverse, um, they are invested in a number of industries and some of those industries did well during COVID. So um, the intermediaries um, reduce the risk through um, diversification. And I won't talk about the types of risk because we'll be talking about that in the next unit, but um, risk transformation, maturity transformation and size transformation are important reasons why we need banks. And the second set of reasons are um, um, asymmetric information. We don't have um, the same amount of information as borrowers um, as the um, savers do. Um, and there's two types of um, situations where adverse information comes into play. 
Number one is in adverse selection. We actually don't know. Lenders don't know how to select projects, whereas banks have specific expertise and experience and history that helps them select um, projects probably better than an individual would. The second is moral hazard in that the borrower um, has a lot more information about projects compared to the um, lender. Uh, and therefore, the borrower might in fact not do the project that he told um, the lender he would do and do something else, or he and she. Um, so it's very important um, to have banks that have expertise in the projects as well, um, and have expertise, have done such projects before, have experience. Um, so that's another reason why banks as financial intermediaries are so important. The third is delegated monitoring. Um, banks have information sharing coalitions due to economies of scale, um, and therefore um, they have the commitment also that comes with the long-term relationships. They have current accounts that are maintained with them, so they have more information. So um, they, they have, we can delegate our monitor, monitoring of those investments um, to savers, um, to the banks who are able to, as, as savers to the banks, um, and they're able to do it a lot more efficiently and a lot more um, cheaply than we could. Um, there's also the um, liquidity insurance function of banks. Um, banks give out these huge um, volumes of loans, but because they also have huge volumes of deposits, um, we can still fund our consumption. So what I mean by that is just because um, the bank has given Dangote a loan um, doesn't mean that we can't go and collect our deposits. Um, which is great. Whereas if we'd given Dan Gotti all our money to spend on a refinery for the next 10 years, um, then we probably wouldn't be able to spend any money in the interim. Um, so they give us liquidity insurance. Um, and the last reason is um, transaction costs. Um, and costs for the transaction um, are mainly searching, screening, verification, monitoring, and enforcement of those loans. And we transfer those costs to the banks and they can do it a lot cheap, a lot more cheaply because they have transaction technology. They're very accessible. They're on the high street or online. They have economies of scale. They have economies of scope. So they let, um, have a lot of different products um, and standardized contracts and all of these things um, help us save costs. So these are the reasons why we need banks um, and why we use banks as opposed to transacting directly um, with businesses. Unit three, risk management. In this unit, we'll be discussing four types of risk management, interest rate risk, market risk, credit risk, and liquidity risk. So interest rate risk is the risk that changes in the short term or long term market interest rates adversely affects the value of a bank's assets and liabilities. The types of interest rate risk are repricing risk, yield curve risk, optionality risk, and basis risk. The interest rate risk can be calculated using the Macaulay duration or the modified duration. And the duration gap is the mismatch between assets and liability. So the greatest, greater the mismatch between assets and liabilities, the greater the duration gap. Interest rate risk can be managed by hedging, trading in derivatives, forward swaps, forward rate agreements, and options. These all offer opportunities to manage the exposure to interest rate risk. Market risk. Market risk refers to the possibility that a bank incurs losses due to adverse movements in the market value of portfolios, marketable assets, and liabilities in the bank. Obviously, in developing countries like Nigeria, we don't have a very advanced structure for marketing assets um, and selling assets on to other financial institutions, but there is a little bit of that, particularly in South Africa, so it's definitely worth knowing about. The Markowitz uh, model is a theoretical framework for analysing the risk and return um, of um, various investments and their interrelationships. And what the Markowitz model aims to do is find the efficient portfolio.
Um, an efficient portfolio is a portfolio expected to yield the highest return for a given level of risk or the lowest risk for a given level of return. How to measure market risk? Uh, one of the most popular ways to measure market risk is by looking at the value at risk. The value at risk is the loss that would be realized if actual portfolio returns fall below a certain defined threshold at the lower end of distribution of possible returns. And, and the formula is there on the slide. Um, there are two main criticisms of value at risk. Number one, um, people say they over relies on the normal distribution. And number two, it assumes that market positions can always be liquidated. And as we know, sometimes they can't, or sometimes it can be very difficult to liquidate a market position. The third type of risk we'll be talking about is credit risk. Credit risk is the risk that the borrower may fail to make the required interest payments or repayment of the principal on a loan, and this would lead to the bank making a loss. Banks are compensated for assuming credit risk by charging a credit risk spread. The risk spread measures the difference between the interest rate on a risky loan and the riskless rates for that same maturity as a measure of credit risk for their assets. Ways of mitigating credit risk. Looking at the risk spread, first of all, the option approach to pricing default risk and credit scoring or credit metrics um, made famous by uh, JP Morgan. The last type of risk we'll be talking about in this unit is liquidity risk. And this is the risk that the bank is unable to pay its assets or meet cash flow obligations resulting from its liabilities without incurring acceptable losses. There are three separate types of liquidity risk. Central bank funding, a central bank liquidity, funding liquidity, and market liquidity. A degree of liquidity risk is unavoidable due to the maturity transformation as we spoke about in unit two. And the solutions are, of course, having the central bank as a lender of last resort, having deposit insurance, and having reserve requirements for banks. And that means each bank keeping a percentage um, of their assets within the central bank. Unit four, credit rationing. This unit on credit rationing um, starts with talking about financial repression. A repressed financial system is one that fails to operate freely due to obstacles such as government policy. Whereas credit rationing refers to any situation in which lenders are willing to advance additional funds to a borrower, even at higher interest rates. McKinnon and Shaw attribute credit rationing to financial repression. However, as you see in the next, as you'll see in the next slide, there are other economists that argue differently. Financial repression damages the economy in two main ways. The low interest rate leads to low savings. Both savings and investments would both be higher if they were market driven. Economic repression actually slows down economic growth and causes capital to be allocated to inefficient projects. However, Stieglitz and Wies have a different model. They argue that rationing occurs whether or not there's government intervention due to the behaviour of banks. You see, one would imagine that banks would like higher interest rates because that it makes more profit or helps them make more profit on their loans. But Stieglitz and Wies, Wies give three reasons why higher interest rates don't always lead to more bank profits. Number one, the banks have imperfect information. Number two, 
there's adverse selection. So those with high risk projects are more likely to apply for loans. And number three, there's moral hazard. Not everybody that says they're going to use loan money for a certain project actually end up doing the project that they said they would. And because of these three reasons, banks ration the amount of um, the amount of loans that they give out. There's also the issue of at higher interest rates. Not only do people with high risk projects become likely to apply, but the safe borrowers are driven away. So the people with, you know, realistic goals about business um, don't sign up for those high interest loans. So um, there's a double whammy in there as well. There's two models of credit, credit rationing that I'd like to talk about um, due to moral hazard. The Holbstrom and Trio model, um, where banks lend to an entrepreneur um, depending on the amount of equity that the entrepreneur has. And then the Bestor and Helwig model, where banks are more likely to, um, banks have to choose between good technology that has a low payoff and a bad technology that has a high risk of failure, but also a very high payoff. Stieglitz and Wills argue, Wies argue that banks will be unwilling to raise interest rate for fear that higher rates will have the adverse effect that I talked about on the last slide of chasing credit worthy borrowers away and the adverse effect of um, adverse incentive of inducing them to undertake greater risks. So instead, banks may opt to restrict the supply of loans, and this gives rise to the backward bending supply curve for credit. There's also the program, um, another cause of fail uh, market failure, overlending, which is almost the opposite of um, credit rationing. That's um, what De Meza and Webb talk about um, as a source of market failure when banks lend more money than they can afford to very speculative projects. Unit five, shadow banking and securitization. Shadow banks perform many of the same activities as banks but they operate outside the scope of banking regulation, including maturity transformation and liquidity functions. They're not backed by deposit insurance. Countries with the largest financial sectors usually have the highest or the largest um, number of shadow banks. Classification can either be activity-based, what they do, or entity-based, what they are, e.g. REITs, private equity funds, money market funds, hedge funds. One of the more interesting instruments that shadow banks trade in is known as a repo. A repo is used by banks and other financial institutions that want to borrow money in the short term. The borrower sells a security to the person that it needs cash from and then buys that security back as a premium. Ways to regulate shadow banks include, number one, regulating the shadow banks directly. Number two, regulating the activities of shadow banks. And number three, regulating the banks and insurance companies that they trade with. Unit six, competition and efficiency in banking markets. Perfect competition. In perfect competition, banks maximize loans and deposits. And the difference between the loan rate and the deposit rate is the margin of intermediation. An increase in the rate of treasury bills 
increases the margin of intermediation. Therefore, a competitive bank will adjust its volume of loans and deposits such that the interest margin between the risk-free rates and the loan rate will be equal to the marginal cost of serving the loans. In a monopoly situation, Monty and Klein show that the bank faces no competition for loans and deposits, but is a price taker for treasury bills. Therefore, there is a downward facing supply curve for loans. However, a rise in the treasury bill rate raises the loan and the deposit rates. One of the key term, bits of terminology um, to know in this unit is called the separability result. That's the fact that the loan rate and the deposit rate are set independently of each other. The Connaught model of imperfect competition describes um, the fact that the more intense the competition between banks, the smaller the spread between the loan and deposit rate. The response of the loan and deposit rates to a change in the treasury bill rate will depend on the in um, intensity of competition given by the number of banks. Loans plus treasury bills plus reserves equal deposits. Measures of competition in banking include the N concentration ratio, this is the share of industry industries large, um, of the industry's largest firms in a defined measure of industry size, like sales, assets, and occasionally the number of employees. The Herfindahl Hirschman index is the sum of the squared market shares of all the firms in the industry. So in a monopoly, that would be 10,000. And the learner index. The learner index measures the intensity of competition by comparing how much a firm's pricing deviates from the perfectly competitive case. So the learner index is equal to price minus marginal cost over price. A learner index of zero would be a perfect competition. A learner index of more than zero would be a monopoly. I think an important point to point out, <laughs> an important statement to point out is that the welfare of retail customers, both borrowers and savers, depends on the intensity of competition between banks. On this slide, we'll look at the structure performance conduct paradigm of bank competition but also the new empir empirical industrial organization view. So the structure performance conduct paradigm argues that the structure of a market influences the conduct of the firms within that market and the conduct influences the performance. So the structure influences the conduct and the conduct influences the, um, the, the performance. Therefore, high industry comp um, concentration leads to low competition and high profits. However, the new empirical organ um, industrial organization places emphasis on behavior rather than structure, although behavior is a lot more difficult to measure. The conjectural variations approach uses the markup test which is a model derived from demand and cost equations to assess market structure from price setting conduct by each bank. The revenue test was developed by Rose and Panza and that examines whether a firm's conduct is in accordance with perfect competition, imperfect competition or monopoly. Finally, we're going to discuss the competition stability versus the competition fragility approach. Um, there's a picture of one of the central bank governors of Nigeria in this slide. 
um, and at the end of the slide I will um, probably tell you or you'll probably um, realise yourself whether he had a competition stability or competition fragility view. His name is Charles Saludo and um, he was very famous, he's one of the famous um, central bank governors of Nigeria um, because when he started his tenure there were over 100 banks in Nigeria and he brought that number um, down to just over 10. So he was an extremely powerful and influential um, central bank governor of Nigeria um, and I think you'd be able to guess by the time I've finished explaining the slide um, which view he took. Competition stability um, argument says that financial stability would be improved by increasing the competition, uh, sorry, by decreasing. So for the competition stability view argues that financial stability would be improved by decreasing the amount of competition between banks leading to higher interest rates, higher profitability and higher market power. And that means that the banks would be less inclined to jeopardize improved valuations with high risk investments. The competition fragility view um, says decreased competition and a tendency for banks to raise interest rates makes borrowers take on higher risk projects to keep up um, with repayments. And this ultimately is bad for banks because it affects their portfolio. Obviously, Charles Saludo um, took the first view, the competition stability approach. What are the measures of efficiency in banking? Well, we have the accounts-based financial performance measures for banking, such as the return on assets, the CIR, the average earnings on assets, the net interest margin, and the calculations for those below. However, a problem with these measures is they're affected by interest charges to borrowers, and those interest rates reflect borrower risk appetite. So it's not comparison, um, it's not comparable over different banks that carry different levels of risk on their balance sheets. Some people have started using um, measuring the performance of banks using a production function or a cost function calculated by using inputs such as labour and capital um, and have divided them into the technically efficient, allocatively efficient or cost efficient organisations. There's also the parametric and non-parametric approach and both have disadvantages and advantages. This final section of this unit is on mergers and acquisitions and how mergers and acquisitions can boost profitability either through market power or through cost savings. However, in cross-border mergers, branches don't have the overlap and this could limit the potential for cost savings channel. Unit 7. Unit 7 is about banking crises. The diamond die big model of bank runs describes two types of depositors. Type A, who wishes to consume in period 1, and type B, who wishes to consume in period 2. Now all depositors invest $1 in period 0. And the proportion of type A depositor that's a depositor that wants to withdraw early in period one, is not known with any certainty. The bank invests some funds in a project that yields returns in period two and is difficult to sell in period one. The diamond dive big model suggests that there's some market imperfection in that and relates it to the cause of bank runs. In terms of financial crises, financial crises like the EME and the global financial crises follow a familiar trend. It starts with liberalisation of the financial sector, 
and then that bubble burst within quite a short period and firms that have borrowed to buy assets at inflated prices that end up in a lot of trouble. I think it's also noteworthy to point out the role of deposit insurance and the way it can cause moral hazard if banks are expecting the um, deposit insurance companies to bail them out when they make reckless mistakes. Um, this is actually, I can't remember whether it's Di Diamond or Dibberg, uh, Di Big, but one of them. Um, and he was um, giving this interview, which can be found um, on YouTube. And, and he argues for full deposit insurance um, to protect the economy from bank runs, not partial. Week eight, banking regulation. So some of the things or mechanisms that are put in place to mitigate risk um, and regulate the banks are things like a risk adjusted capital adequacy ratio, minimum levels of equity capital and stress tests. There's also the central bank as a lender of the last resort and the deposit insurance organization. However, it's important to remember that the lender of the last resort function, often played by the central bank, may give rise to moral hazard as banks take increasing risks, believing that they will receive a government bailout. So that's the end of the banking and finance, um, banking and capital markets module. Um, I hope I've given a very good overview of all eight units. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, and if you have any additions, please let me know and I'll try and add them in, in the next recording. Thanks for listening.